All right, so welcome everybody. I have the pleasure of getting us started today. I'm Josette Lewis with the Allman Board, and this was definitely a team sport putting this on. It's a really packed agenda with a lot of content on some of our most important uh, pests and diseases in the almond industry. We're coming off a hard year of low prices and high input costs. So I hope everyone will leave today with at least one new insight on ways that they could help reduce some of the costs of controlling pests and diseases by using I proven IPM practices or perhaps uh, increase the quality and get the highest price from their handler. Um, either way is a good way to improve your bottom line. And there's no better way to kick off today except, uh, than with our most expensive pest, navel orange worm, and to really drill in initially on the economics, the economics of the cost and the return on investment of using different IPM practices. So with that, I'll call up uh, Brittany Goodrich from UC Davis to kick us off. And Mel, why don't you come up here too? I will say that most of our speakers are here all day. So if you don't get time um, to ask questions after each of the presentations, please make sure to grab them. Um, this is meant to be uh, a great opportunity for you to talk to some of the experts, whether they're researchers or whether they're your peers. Um, or some of the experts uh, in the industry. So really hope you'll make good advantage of those informal conversations as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Brittany. Yes, sir. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm here first to kick us off talking about the fun stuff, the, the economics of it all. So we're talking about costs and returns of navel orange worm control. I wanted to start off just kind of to give an overview. I mean, I don't think that I probably have to, to remind any of you about the status of almond profitability right now. We're at a point where we are experiencing relatively low almond prices due to a number of, of trade issues and container shipping problems that we've been seeing. And then we're also seeing historically high input costs from inflationary pressures, the Ukraine war impacting fertilizer prices and high fuel prices. So we're really at a point where we have to really pay close attention to every dollar that we're spending. So that's kind of to get us in the framework of thinking about this navel orange worm pest management. It's, it's really important to be scrutinizing the, the dollars that we're spending on our pest management practices. So I wanted to, to kick this off by giving us kind of a look at where we're at now with navel orange worm pest management. Uh, in almonds and so the way we did this uh, a graduate student that I'm working with Scott Somerville who's in the back He'll answer all of the hard questions on this for you But we actually use the pesticide use reporting database to look at um, On average, what are we spending? Uh, well, how many applications are we putting on to control navel orange worm and almonds and then also how much are we spending? So the way we did this we we picked out specific pesticide products that are targeting navel orange worm. We talked with Dr. Houston Wilson and Chuck Burks, who are entomologists who are very knowledgeable about navel orange worm control. And we picked out the, the timing when those pesticide products would actually be used for navel orange worm specifically. And so we've kind of quantified them uh, at the county level to, to figure out how often we're applying these pesticides and how much it's costing growers to do that. So this gives you a look at the average number of navel orange worm pesticide applications per acre. So on average statewide, we're looking about 1.4 applications specifically targeting navel orange worm. But there's quite significant variation in this, in that, well, in Placer County, where there's, there's very few almonds, you're looking at 0.2 applications per acre. But further south in Fresno County, we're looking at two applications per acre. So there's quite a bit of variation throughout the state of California. So in terms of the cost of the materials per acre, on average, we use 2022 prices for the, the 2019 through 2021 average. There's some issues with that, which we could discuss later on over coffee or something. But anyways, we're using 2022 prices. In terms of materials targeting navel orange worm control, we're looking at about $68 per acre for the statewide average. But again, there's a lot of variation in this. Fresno County, you're up to $99 per acre. 
spent on navel orange worm control. And then you can also add in what we've done on this one is add in the application cost, which we've assumed to be about $17 per acre. Also, we've added in any mating disruption that is used. And so in, when, when those are factored in, we're looking at spending on average about $99 per, per acre, but up to $146 per acre in Fresno County. So again, pretty significant variation in terms of, of costs of naval orange worm control. And this doesn't include any winter sanitation in it as well. So this is just giving us an idea of where we're at right now. And so I also wanted to highlight, because I know some folks are, have been thinking about the use of mating disruption. So this is just kind of doing a comparison across the use of mating disruption 2016 to 2018 is on the left. On the right hand side, we have 2019 to 21, the average. So the statewide average most recently was about 5.7% of almond acreage is using mating disruption. This might be a little low because I've heard that uh, some of the mating disruption products haven't actually been reported in the pesticide use reporting database, but regardless, it gives us an idea. We've increased the use of mating disruption from about 3.4% in 2016 to 18, up to about 5.7%. And you can see that some of the counties have gotten darker, so mating disruption has been increasing pretty much across the board. So some tools uh, that we can think of, I wanted to point some tools out to help thinking about some of these navel orange worm IPM issues. So one of the things that I do at UC Davis is I run the cost and return studies program where we put out enterprise budgets for all of California's major commodities. We are in the process of updating our almond cost studies. The most recent cost study was done in 2019. So be on the lookout for, for that coming out within the next year or so. I'm also going to walk through kind of a, a partial budget analysis framework to think about some of your uh, naval orange worm uh, costs and returns and, um, and also be on the lookout. I'm, I'm just promising a lot of things to you, uh, but I promise they will come out. We're in the process of developing a naval orange worm economic decision tool where we can compare some of these IPM programs that, that you're looking at. And we'll, we'll walk through one of these examples uh, in a second. So again, this is, if you Google UC Davis cost studies, you can find the cost study website. You can find all of previous almond studies that are fairly useful. We detail all of the assumptions that are going into naval orange worm control. So it can kind of help you think about all of the money that you're spending on naval orange worm control and then also compare that to the, the relative benefits um, in terms of damage reduction. We can kind of think about uh, the, the partial budget analysis is a good way to think about changing practices where you put all of your additional costs and reduced revenues on the left hand side. You detail out all of your additional revenues and reduced costs on the right hand side. So those are the good things on the right hand side, bad things on the left. So I've just put in a general example just to get you thinking about how we would use this partial budget analysis framework. So, it, you know, we can think about any change to our naval orange worm IPM program. So maybe we're thinking of adding mating disruption. Maybe we're thinking about increasing the number or changing the active ingredient that we're applying for our pesticide applications. Maybe we're going to increase or decrease our winter sanitation efforts. And then associated with that is going to be some sort of change in revenue from potentially some decreased damage rates, potentially you might see higher prices associated with those decreased damage rates, and you might see just higher yields because of the lower damage rates as well. So this is just a broad way of thinking about it. I'm gonna go more into, into detail. I'm gonna walk you through just an example of something that I put together using this navel orange worm decision tool that's in a very rough stage that probably nobody can understand except for me and Scott. So that's why it hasn't been released yet, but we're gonna look at changes in two different IPM programs. These are the assumptions that are going into the changes that I'm gonna detail. So we have labor costs at $26 an hour for machine operator labor 
hand labor is about $23 per hour. These include the overhead costs as associated with labor as well. And we have uh, winter sanitation. We're going to shake, sweep, blow, and mow the mummy nuts. We also have two hours of hand pulling labor in there. And so the total cost of the winter sanitation is about $277 an acre. I'm using that $17 per acre for the pesticide application costs, and I'm using that statewide average for our pesticide materials costs. So we're looking at $68 per acre for, for pesticide materials. Of course, that's gonna vary depending on the specific pesticides that you're using. For a total pesticide application cost of about $85 an acre. And mating disruption, we're assuming costs $120 an acre and then we're using a price, an almond price of $1.76. We're using Blue Diamond's crop delivery schedule for premiums and discounts associated with the navel orange worm damage rates, and then a yield of 2,200 pounds per acre. So what we're doing is we're going to compare this navel orange worm IPM program one, where we're gonna do winter sanitation, a spring pesticide application, and a whole split pesticide application. And we're going to consider changing to this navel orange worm IPM program two, where we do winter sanitation, mating disruption, and a whole split pesticide application. And so in this case, our damage rates don't change. They stay at a percent rejects of 2.1%. So we have that winter sanitation costs for IPM program one. We decrease our pesticide application costs because we've decreased one pesticide application in the second IPM program, but we've increased that mating disruption cost. And so in this example, I want to stress that this is not going to be the case for everyone. Everyone's going to have different resulting damage rates from different IPM programs. But in this case, we've increased our cost by $35 an acre. We've had no change in revenue. So we're expecting a loss of $35 per acre if we switch to mating disruption. Okay? So what happens if we switch to mating disruption, switch to this new IPM program, and we actually decrease our damage rates? So in this example, we went from a 2.1% rejects with IPM program one to the use of mating disruption in IPM program two, we have decreased our percent rejects to 1.5%. So what that means is we have increased our costs, same as the last time, $35 an acre, but because we have lower rejects, we have a higher almond price received from the handler, and then we also have a few more almonds per acre. So your revenues increase by $67 per acre, so this one is a net gain of $31 an acre. So this kind of shows you what, what we should be considering when we're making these decisions. So a lot of times we only think of, oh, you know, we have such, mating disruption is so costly, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to fork out that extra money, but if it is going to actually result in lower damage rates, um, it might be a net benefit to employ some of, some of these more costly pest management methods. So another way of thinking of this, and this is something that I generated using that navel orange worm economic decision tool is you can think at varying almond prices, what is that break-even damage rate that you would need to justify the switch to this IPM program too, so the, the mating disruption. And so you can see where I did a almond price of about $1.76. So that break-even damage percentage is about 1.7%. So if you could decrease it to about 1.7%, at $1.76 almond price, that pays off. Once you get to higher almond prices, you actually could only decrease the, the damage rate to about 1.8% and have that mating disruption pay off. You have to think about what's the almond price going to be in the fall, what can I reasonably expect, and can I get a reasonable damage rate to justify that use of mating disruption or whatever the IPM change you're considering. Another way to think about it is we can vary the cost of mating disruption. So we went back to that price of $1.76 per pound. You can see that at mating disruption costs for 100 or $110 per acre, you really 
don't need to decrease the damage percentage all that much to have it make sense. So if you decrease your damage percentage by just 0.1% for 100 or $110 cost of mating disruption per acre, you actually are in a net benefit. Whereas at $120, you needed a 1.7, you needed to get the damage rate down to 1.7%. So we can sort of use these, these break-even frameworks to think about, okay, I don't know exactly what the almond price is going to be or, um, you know, at that point, but we can, we can use them to kind of assess the risk of adopting this, this mating disruption or, or whatever IPM strategy you're thinking of, of um, adopting. So that's all I have. I probably went over my time, but again, upcoming in 2023, expect almond cost and return studies to be updated, and then this IPM economic decision-making tool. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, my role here today is to talk about uh, economic losses in a different fashion looking at uh, what you can lose in the field and lose at the hauler as well. So. Arch enemy number one, obviously, is the navel orange worm. This is where we're focusing today, but there's other pests in here that play a role in this as well. So m most everybody recognizes the damage. Occasionally, I run into somebody that doesn't recognize the damage. And I have to point out that in this case is what we call rattlesnakes. These things have been there for a while. These are big worms. These are small ones, not small ones. However, you get into the pinhole damage, a little harder to recognize. If you use a mechanical pencil, you know, a half millimeter mechanical pencil is a great simulator of pinhole damage. That hole is that small. If you shove that into a kernel, it's exactly what you're looking at. And it can be deceiving, and that is going to be a later season infestation that it's important to recognize when you got hit because it can affect what you're doing for controls. There's other things at play here, though, as far as reject damage in your crop. And lately, we've seen the plant bugs really turn on and cause a lot of problems with brown spot. Traditionally, that's been the leaf-footed plant bug, but lately it's been the stink bugs. And we've actually had a few growers that wound up with their crops being relegated down to oil stock, no value, because of the degree of brown spot, over 30% damage. So recognizing plant bugs, walking through the fields, looking for that exit date early in the season, and you can see that coming out of the, out of the sting where they actually uh, penetrate in the nut. Later on, as those nuts start to discolor, they're fairly obvious. They're discoloring because they're dying, they're going to fall from the tree, and that's something you're not going to recognize in your crop. You're not going to see that in the harvest. Those things are gone. If you open them up, you can see the, the sting marks inside, and you'll see in some cases where that bug has penetrated that nut multiple times. It's not just a single sting, particularly with the, the stink bugs and the brown marmorated stink bug. And that's the damage that you get. If you've never seen brown spot, that's typically what it looks like, although the USDA does say that you can have the discoloration without a depression, or the depression without a discoloration, it is still brown spot and it's still deemed as a reject. Okay, ants. Ants are deceiving little buggers, okay? And ants can cause you a lot of problems. You, you never even know they're there, okay? Typically, th that's the damage you see. It looks like an ice cream scoop. It'll carve out that inside of the nut, leaving the peel. But the real creative ones will take everything out, leaving nothing but the peel. And that's why I say they, they're really deceiving because they get blown out at harvest, and you never know if they were even there, okay? Um, I have seen instances where fields had just a few population, a little bit of, of uh, oil seed weeds out there. Spurge and purslane, okay? They love the spurge and the purslane. Uh, pigweed, those are high oil seed seeds, and or high oil level seeds, and they'll thrive on them, and you can actually create more problems in your orchard if you have those weeds out there around the orchard. So just back to rejects in general, it's, it's the gift that keeps on taking, okay? You have the loss in premium value, and you have the loss in weight, okay? So it, it really hits you twice. Now, your statements are the final word, but that doesn't give you a, an image of really what's going on in your field, and you need to be careful. For a navel orange worm, your actual losses, you can figure it's double what you're seeing in the statement. Why? Because the real light stuff is getting blown out at the harvest, okay? And then the shellerman, that's their job is to clean up some of that stuff. Say, a, a good operator with a good gravity deck and knows what he's doing, he's playing a musical instrument and he's taking a lot of those rejects out. So if you're at 2% of the statement, you were four in the field. It's a real easy number to pick. Color sorter damage really messes this up though. And there's a lot of color shellers now that are putting color sorters in the final stages. And when I say it messes it up, they do a good job of cleaning. So that twice the level of your statement might be wrong if you're at a facility that's using color sorters because they're taking more out, okay? I think that ants might be worse. 
Okay, operative word is think. It just depends on what kind of level you've got, when they're coming in, when they're feeding, where they're at in the field. They might be just on one edge. I've seen them working berms on lands that have been leveled. They might be through the entire orchard. By the way, flood irrigation does not mean you're immune from ants. I've seen ants that just own the berms or the mounds. So you got to be careful with that. And uh, they, they can really get you. And by the way, I, I, I'm very blunt with this. Having ant damage in ammons is kind of dumb. The baits work. They're really economical. They're very effective. And it, as an almond grower, it's the single most gratifying thing you get to do all year long. You put it out, within 15 minutes, they're taking it home. Okay? Nothing else you do, you can see visually what's happening. Within 15 minutes, they're taking home the bacon. It's kind of fun to watch. Okay? For plant bugs, early season damage is not going to be quantified. Those nuts that they've killed and dropped off the tree, they're gone. So if you have early season damage, you're not going to see it. What you're getting measured in your statements is the stuff that's late season damage that didn't fall from the tree. Okay? So it's actually going to be greater than the losses in the statement. This thing gets a little busy. This is really, really loud here, really busy. I'm going to try to drift over here where I can see it myself. This is a 2,500 pound crop at $2 a pound. Okay, all sorts of fancy numbers. This just dropped down to the bottom line. Okay, 10% rejects. And I, when I do this, I always say, why did I go to 10%? Because I've had growers living between 8 and 12 who had never had problems before in really bad years. So the third column says reject weight. That's the reject weight that's lost at the handler. What actually came in that the handler will deduct. The fourth column says sheller loss. Okay, that's what the guy with the gravity deck cleaned out. Okay, and that's why I say it's double what you're seeing in these statements. If you go across there and you see the loss column, this would be the fourth from the right. I can't even read it from here. $1,492, I think it is. Okay, that's the losses per acre. Okay, at two bucks a pound and a 2,500 pound crop. And if you take that loss column, just work your way down, you can see what the losses are. The next column shows you the step losses at each succeeding step, what your losses are. So it's a really easy situation. You say, I can't afford to pick a topic. Well, pick your reject level where you're at a two to a four or a two to a three, and you can figure out how much you're losing. In the current price environment, what are for 2,000 pounds at a buck and a half? Okay, so bottom line, 994 bucks. It's a little less uh, per, per uh, increment. It's about, about 70 bucks or so per increment. That's what you're looking at. Okay, it's a significant value. Uh, again, when I hear growers say, I can't afford to, you know, pick your favorite topic that they don't want to do, this is one that you can look at this and say, this is what I could lose. Now, this assumes non-pro meat deliveries. It assumes everything else is good. We're just working our way down on reject levels alone. And with that, I'm done. So going to keep this short and sweet. I guess I got five minutes to go through this. The slide on the left shows a leaf-footed bug damaged nut that split early in the season. And this is around July 10th. We're getting late instar larvae. So there's a negative feedback loop uh, with leaf-footed bug damage and green stink bug damage nuts and navel orange worm when they're in your orchard. I just want to bring it up because, uh, as was mentioned before, we're seeing more of that and more of that every year. And, and it's becoming a greater problem. So this slide here, I recently updated it with our 50,000 mummy nuts that we cracked this year. This is the past 17 years of collecting mummies from around the state. We go to every one of our ranches. We collect 30 to 50 mummies per variety per block. And then we uh, crack them out. We inspect the holes. We inspect the shells. We inspect the nut meats and we look at all the larvae and tally them up um, every season. So we can come up with an estimate for the statewide average of the number of navel orange room larvae per mummy. And I don't know if you've been driving around right now and seeing all the mummies that are still out in orchards. This number on the far right, 2022, so we collect them in November and December before sanitation is the third highest in the past 17 years at about 27, 28 larvae per 100 mummies. That dotted red line represents the, you know, the ongoing, you know, 17 year average of about 20 worms in 100 mummies. So what we do after we go out and do all this for every single one of our clients, every single block, after sanitation is done, we go back out and count all the mummies in the trees. So we can come up with an estimate and it's reasonably accurate within reason 
for how many navel orange worm you have in your orchards um, on a per acre basis. So if you want to look kind of at the historical navel orange worm populations, if, you know, back in the 90s, we had 100 trees to the acre. Two mummies per tree was the original UC kind of recommendation. And at that infest of 20 worms per 100 mummies, half are females, half are males. That is a 20 navel orange worm female per acre value. At 140 trees to the acre, we're up to about 28 females per acre at two mummies per tree. I can tell you this year, that is, we're not going to hit two mummies per tree in most of the state. <laughs> On the west side, there are many orchards that have hundreds of mummies per tree still. So one more real ugly table for you guys to look at. After the last couple, I, I'm sorry to throw this at you, but we got three different scenarios here based on your yield per acre, 1,500, 2,500, 3,500 pounds to the acre, different nut sizes, 22, 28, 34 nuts per ounce. So we can figure out how many nuts you have per acre. So when you come up with a value of how many nuts there are per acre and you use different numbers of eggs per female, I like to use 150, you can make some reasonable estimates of the threat level of your navel orange worm population to your crop. So you can see the ones I have circled on a 2,500 pound crop, 1% harvest damage by count. We do everything by count, not by weight. So our numbers are even worse when we take harvest samples from the field than you will see at your processor, as was described before. Um, we can see that between 75 and 180 females per acre, we can expect between one and two and a half percent damage to the to the crop, you know, in July when the moth is flying the second flight. But you can see there's a huge range, and we deal with this all the time. You can have numbers, you know, for 26 down on a 1,500 pound crop, up to 95 on a 3,500 pound crop for 1% damage. So we see this play out in the real world all the time. It's, it's just math. Um, anyways, uh, this year, the, the January 2023 almond position report showed a 2.02% non pearl reject number. That, you know, roughly with a little bit of math, comes out to 100 to 150 females per acre during July. You know, I get it, some of that's probably third flight pinhole damage getting in, but uh, it's a reasonable assessment that we're not sanitizing enough, you know, to keep those numbers below 2% to get our premiums. So here's a navel orange female in a trap. How many eggs? Well, this one had 180. So that 150 number I use isn't always good. We see numbers between 75, 80, up to 300 eggs per female. So there's slop in the real world, just like you all know. <laughs> so here is a scenario where you don't want to be. This is a, a Peterson navel orange room trap. It uses a pistachio almond bait to attract mated females. And when we put these things out and we see large numbers of navel orange room females in them, and the way I look at this, whether it's monitoring or mass trapping, I look at that as how many times that tree is being visited over the course of the year. So if I'm catching four or five over the course of the spring, you've got a really low population. When you see 30, 40, 50 in a week, you are running into a big world of hurt. So these only capture mated females, or primarily, few, Few, few males and a few non-mated females show up in them. I just want to show a little example of a, a mass trapped ranch in Madeira that we did a few years ago with about 12 traps to the acre. This grower sanitized to zero. No mummies in the tree or on the ground. And the, the middle picture shows it pretty good, how many uh, moths per trap were being caught on the edge, and that is a neighbor problem. I think a lot of us are going to be dealing with that this year. You can't spray out your neighbor's moths. It just doesn't work. <laughs> if they're flying into your field, migrating across your, your block, it's just difficult to deal with. With the, the mass trapping, we've had some pretty good success reducing those numbers across large distances, but it takes a lot of traps to do that because these moths are very, uh, very capable flyers. So if you're doing mass trapping, I install one trap 
per acre for every six naval orange room female per acre. So we use that estimation process. If that number stays less than six, sometimes we don't even have to spray naval orange room. When that number's 30 or 40 in a trap, you're in a big trouble and you need to talk to your PCA and do whatever you can. <laughs> um, of course, like anything scientific, there is an infinite number of assumptions that go into this stuff. Your ranch is unique. I cannot tell you exactly how it'll play out. But uh, anyways, that is it for my stuff. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, you're probably used to seeing when there's been a major national disaster, like a hurricane or something, they have the meteorologist and they have the FEMA guy on TV, then the search and rescue team, and then there's the local guy, and he's the guy that just got his house blown down. Well, that's me. I'm the local guy. Um, I live very close by here. Um, I'm a PCA that works um, Stanislaus County. This is my home territory. And Naval Orange Worm has scarred me for life. And as I look across this room, I think probably all of us here have that haunted look in our eyes of that gray that's maybe a little farther south on uh, Mel Machado's chart than what we'd like. It's a tough pest. Bob Beatty said uh, it's the toughest pest of his career. And I think most of us would agree with that. Um, I think to, un to fight what we're dealing with, we have to understand what exactly it is that we're fighting. Naval orange worm is a desert moth. It was originally discovered in Arizona, Southern California the northern part of Mexico. In the desert, you have a long ways between food sources. You might have a little oasis here with something that it might be miles and miles before you find the next food source. This isn't the peach twig borer that's used to fluttering around, um, you know, nice, wumpy areas where there's food all over the place. This is something that's used to hunting and searching for its next meal. So that's where we get um, some of the behaviors I think we see here, including when they find something, we see them all come together. They all pile on, right? So imagine in a desert you have an oasis and the food source is found. The pest needs to maximize it. So it calls in all of its buddies right to that one spot. Here we have something good. So well, that's where we see more than one worm per nut. We might see two might see five, might even see 10 worms in a single nut. They're maximizing the food source. That's why we see how they can uh, signal very long distances uh, to call in a mate. Um, so I think as, as we understand that, I think that helps us realize why, why it behaves the way it is. When we spray, we put our residual out across um, a field and the moths are literally able to smell the nuts that haven't been treated yet and lay their eggs right there. I mean, how tough is that for a pest to kill? As we think about how navel orange worm uh, behaves, then we, I think that gives us an idea of how we need to treat it. Um, we know with sprays that we can only kill about, maybe I think the AM board has said 50% population reduction with a single treatment. Um, and I think we've seen maybe a little better than that in some circumstances and sometimes a little bit worse. Uh, we know what the best um, uh, management tool is for sanitation, but let's be realistic. Sanitation, reducing habitat, um, can we really do that? If you think of those nuts as, as oasises for, for that pest, can we go out there and destroy all of those? Not in a wet year, uh, we're going to be left with a lot, lot of mummies out there. Um, sprays are expensive. They're getting even more expensive. Um, I think our, probably our best tool is mating disruption. I think the next speaker will talk, talk more about that. Um, I can say where we're at right here, we're under a fair amount of mating disruption. Guys are very rapidly adopting it. I really appreciate the economic cost studies that we saw. Um, I think that gives us a good idea of where we're at. The good news is, I think, um, the cost of mating disruption is coming down even farther from what she had on her chart. Um, we're seeing 
um, those costs get decreased on the per acre basis. We're probably seeing application costs go up for driving a sprayer through the field. So I think that economic threshold of where mating disruption makes sense is even lower. Um, and, you know, to speak to um, not just the growers and the PCAs in the room, but um, those of you on the Ammon board, uh, those of you that are uh, looking out for us on maybe a statewide basis, um, I would say that we need to fight navel orange worm at my opinion here. Rather than saying a 1% threshold or a 2% threshold is good enough, I think we need to look at how close can we come to eradicating the pest across the state of California. You think of the economic damage to the grower that comes through on his blue diamond statement. I think we have to look at the economic damage beyond that just to our industry when we have to go into uh, the marketplaces, very sensitive markets like uh, the European Union and tell them what our aspergillus levels are within these loads of nuts. Um, if we could get uh, this pest damage down to zero, get the aspergillus level out of those loads, um, we would have a much more marketable product that I think would trickle back eventually to better returns to the grower. Um, we need a statewide effort, and I think we're all in this room here uh, to come together and um, see what we can do to reduce navel orange worm. But um, when it comes to products like mating disruption, as you can see in the chart there she had, she had um, the cost of mating disruption, she had where to keep the damage exactly the same with the same spray, spray program, et cetera. Um, it was like plus or minus $35 an acre, right? So you think of the grower sitting there trying to make that decision, should I use mating disruption or not? Well, it's, it's, right now it's really close. If we had the help to get that cost down just a little bit more, I think instead of having 20, 30, 40% adoption of mating disruption, we could get up to 75, 80, 90% adoption of mating disruption. And when, once we have 90% of the acres in California under mating disruption, I think we'll be very close to pest eradication. Uh, growers can do something else in the summertime besides uh, spray worms in 110 degree temperatures, and uh, we'll have a lot better crop to sell on the market. One more point to growers, I think. Um, as we looked at the damage, damage charts going down from 1% to 10%, I think probably the, the, one of the worst enemies of keeping us from getting that 10% or that 8% or that 6% damage is years and years of 1%. Uh, we'll have a, a grower that gets along perfectly fine for 20 years on a similar program and then for some reason, Naval Orange Room decides this ranch here is the new oasis. And, they, and we'll see a mass group of moths come in and absolutely swamp a single field. I don't know exactly why. I've seen uh, orchards that had never caught more than five moths in a Peterson trap on a weekly basis catch 40 in a single night. Something weird, weird's going on there, but I think that's where we suddenly see a, a grower, grow, grower go from a 1% or 2% damage to suddenly he popped up at, at a 10% damage. So my message to growers is, and PCAs is don't let a 1% or a 2% damage lull you into a sense of complacency. Once that 10% damage is out there in the field, uh, we can't put those nuts back in the cart. Thank you. All right, and then next we have Abby um, with Simeos. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Abby. Like she said, I am an entomologist at Simeos, and I'm just going to talk really quickly about a change that we're making at Simeos for monitoring navel orange worm. And I think it goes really well with what we've been talking about so far. And I'm really excited Justin's here because he is kind of the guy of Vernet Meal Lures. And so, um, it's exciting. <laughs> so just going to talk a little bit about the brief history of navel orange worm monitoring, what an ideal lure looks like for us at Simios, and then interpreting this new information and how we're using it to make management decisions. 
So really quickly, I think everybody is pretty familiar with monitoring of navel orange worms so far, but egg traps were the initial tool back in the day, in the 70s. Uh, and then there's been a lot of different caramones that have been identified to test for attractiveness to navel orange worm. Uh, PPO originally as a female attractant, and then there's the biolore, which is a sex pheromone. It's only attracted to males, um, and that's what we've been typically using up until now. That's not necessarily all that great for us, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So the pheromone-based biolore, like I said, it only catches males. Don't really care that much about what the males are doing out there. We really only care about what the females are doing. The other thing about it, it at a mating disruption company, those biolores actually get shut down under a mating disruption plume, so it actually just takes away all of our information, and it's not very helpful at all. And because we're able to track whether our pheromone is being released in other ways, we don't actually need to check it with the pheromone lure anymore, which is why we're trying to move away from that. Some of the other issues that we've had with it is saturation of the liners. So when they're shaking, they get really full. Um, when we change the lures, they, they tend to spike because they're really strong for a couple of days. Um, and so then we have to go out and change the liner again because they've been saturated again. Um, so not super ideal for us. So we're after something that's tracking the females, giving us some kind of indication of egg laying risk. It takes longer to saturate those liners. There's no evidence of lure spiking when those lures are being changed. So those are all things that we were after. So we actually put nut meal lures out in the field last year with a couple of our growers. And this is just kind of explaining our trial here. We did two large orchards, one of almonds and one of pistachios, both with high pressure. Then we had two smaller orchards that had lower pressure and then another small orchard that was in under moderate pressure. So trying to test all scenarios of population size. Uh, and we collected the liners weekly and then we refreshed those lures based off of manufacturer guidelines, so every eight or every six to eight weeks. So just a couple of data points just to give you an idea of what we've seen. On the top in red is the bio lore data, and then on the bottom is our nut meal lore data. And I think the thing that we really want to point out is first, obviously, those bio lore traps, they shut down after mating disruption gets going. But we've been able to actually clearly see four flights within the nut meal based lures in, in almonds, which has gotten us fairly excited because this is tracking females. And like I said, it's matching up really well with what we expect navel orange worm's life cycle to be throughout the season. Um, so as you can see, we put this on a calendar day, but these are also the first, second, third, fourth flights are by degree days. And as you can see, those are lining up really well with what we would expect. So how do we use all of this information within the season to predict flights? It's nice to be able to go back in hindsight and see all of that, but how do you do it as it's actively happening to you? So we are confident that this is tracking females, uh, like Justin said, mostly mated females, some maybe not mated, we have caught males as well. Um, but I think it's important to remember that mating disruption is delaying that mating, so we, we do expect to still see some mated females on those liners. Um, but we will, throughout this season, be providing short videos and things like that on how we expect to interpret this data and how you might use it to manage your uh, fields in the, in the coming season. But just to go over really quickly some of the things we might expect you to see and what we have seen in this last couple of seasons. If you look here, we've got two properties. So property A is on top in the blue and then property B is on the bottom. And there's just a couple of different things happening. So in red is the biolore data. That orange line is the non prel hole split timing. And what we've seen uh, on property A especially is that we're seeing the generation is, is more likely to be exposed to a whole split insecticide in a scenario. At the top there in the nut meal lore data, as you can see, the, the flight is actually straddling whole split and we were able to capture that. It is doing that in the bio lore data as well, but that changes, that story changes in property B. And as you can see, the biolore data is straddling whole split, but the nut meal lore data is suggesting that the female flight actually occurred before whole split even started. And so those are some of the things we've been able to capture recently with this, da with this data, and we've been very excited in how that will help with timing and being more efficient with those sprays. Um, because that's been one of our growers' biggest challenges is just making sure that we're efficient when we're applying those sprays and we're not missing the flight completely. Um, and then subsequently, how do you time those pollinizer later flights after the fact? And we're really hopeful that this will help also time those as well because now you can start to tease out 
if they were susceptible to fresh nuts or mummy nuts and when you sprayed those um, and then the timing for that as well because that timing will change depending on what they're feeding on. With that, I think we're doing questions now. Um, any questions? Yes, sir, in the back. I'm going to repeat the question. That, um, what, so across the three of them, what would be the ideal monitoring um, tool that you would be using for um, navel orange worm? Yeah, I guess it comes down to how you interpret it. It's, you know, that's always the case. So all of these have different interpretations. You go back to the egg trap, it was the same way. So all we're doing is looking at different ways to get to how many navel orange worm there are in the system and when is the right time to treat them. So I, I go back to the trap is just to confirm what you should already know. I think you need to go out and crack your mummies and look more carefully at what's in the orchard. I get it, it doesn't help you with your neighbors. The traps definitely help with that. They should be picking them up. I've always been more interested in the mated female than the, because more in a trap you know, is not always a better indicator. And in a male trap, they call for such a long distance that sometimes it gives you misreading data. So I, I've found that for how I interpret a trap and the information that the, the, the female traps provide what I need to do to make decisions pretty effectively. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think nothing probably haunts us more than when we had a Peterson trap out in the orchard that never caught more than four in the season, and then we go out and start cracking nuts and we're probably already at a four or five percent. And we wonder how, how did the trap miss it? Um, I will say this, if you, get a, if you get a high trap count, do something. You can't say watch it another week. Um, you, need, you need to pull the trigger. You can't, you can't um, dig your way back out of that problem once it's going. Um, if I had a magic wand, I would say probably to get access to all the surrounding fields and not just the growers' fields. Um, I think if we were able to see everything, all the traps that are within three miles of our traps as well, uh, that, would, that would really help us out. There's a lot of back and forth between PCAs and, and companies and so forth to, to try and um, give people an edge up on what the population's doing. But you shake non perel in one field, and then they come all come crashing over in, into the next field, next variety. You might not see that one coming where if you had visibility all around you, I think maybe you'd have an inkling. I would say the same things echo them. Uh, for us, it might be a little bit different. We're probably after something, um, like I said, that tracks flights. Uh, it is in low numbers, and sometimes they don't always hit, but uh, we have seen pretty consistently some flight tracking, and that's exciting for us because it's, it's more than we've ever had before. And um, I'd say if I had a mag magic wand, I'd love to have a lure that works more like something in an apple system of her codling moth where you can have thresholds and be confident in those thresholds. Um, but we don't have that. So we're just looking for what we can do. And um, we're pretty excited for the change with the nut meal lures and what it means for us, especially with daily counts um, and how that might look throughout the season. So. We're excited. Hopefully it'll change things. All right. Thank you um, very much to our panelists. And up next is Josette introducing. So uh, here's a couple of different um, opportunities for growers to look at um, cost sharing around IPM and also some new tools to do just as Joe was asking to be able to see what's going on with your neighbor. Um, so these are two programs the Almond Board are involved with and that are available for growers to participate. So I'll turn it over to Jesse to, to get us going for, and maybe you could just cover the whole panel there. Good morning. I, uh, it's really great to see everybody in the audience, a lot of great folks from uh, Stanislaus County and uh, beyond. This is a project that's, uh, that's near and dear. It's funded by the Department of Pesticide Regulation and it's in partnership with uh, Mel, with Blue Diamond Growers, Jalindra, with Cooperative Extension, and then Land IQ has been our partner. 
in what I'd call ag neighbors. Uh, I want to make it a verb. As we've heard, neighbors really have a big impact on how you farm. And this project is an effort to capitalize on that and make it work for you. How do you partner with your neighbors? Do a better job at pest management regionally. We've, we've talked about mating disruption. We know that this is a product and, uh, that works better at scale. You saw in Emily's maps, adoption is greater in the typically larger ranches down south and less further north where they may be smaller. That could be due to a variety of reasons, but one, one uh, piece that UC has shown us is that mating disruption is more effective at scale, at least at 40 acres and then even 100 acres or more. So we do have these two guides on tools and monitoring. So I, I, I'm leaving them up here. I know uh, if you can't get them now, they're probably on our table, or you can go to our website and find them. But these are some really good ways. If, if the things you're hearing now are of interest, you can actually go back uh, at your leisure and watch these videos online to learn more about monitoring tools and also the, these uh, four, and I've heard now there's a fifth uh, manufacturer of mating disruption products. The program for Naval Orange Worm IPM has been pretty set for a number of years. Uh, monitoring, orchard sanitation, timely harvest, insecticides, and then the newest one is mating disruption. And it, it comes up, and I remember the last time we did this summit, why should we do this on an area-wide basis? And there's a whole list here on the right about why neighborhood management, and I call it neighborhood management because it's voluntary. Area-wide is typically something that people associate with a mandatory program. What uh, this project, what Ag Neighbors is trying to do, is doing, is connecting people up locally, and it started here in West Modesto, and we've now expanded this availability of the online tool statewide it's to allow people the opportunity to connect up and manage this pest regionally. We know that one, one prime reason to do this as a region is because, as we've said, the harvest happens at different times, but also there are multiple crops. So we know navel orange worm moves back and forth. For example, in, in this chart from, from Brad Higby and Joel Siegel, from pistachios, into almonds. So if you're close to a pistachio orchard, we know that you're at a higher risk of navel orange worm damage. The goal of this project, it's located at agneighbors.com, is to increase the use of navel orange worm mating disruption among growers of almonds, walnuts, and pistachios, particularly in smaller parcels. We know that damage is reduced. The studies that UC Cooperative Extension did and wrapped up in 2018, 2019, showed that in larger blocks of 100 acres or more, it can reduce damage as much as 78%. What is the ask here? Go to Ag Neighbors, fill it out uh, for whether you're a PCA or a grower, choose your field whether or not you do mating disruption, and then where you can see where folks around you are also have an interest. And then once the, the tool, if you know them, you can of course reach out and talk to them, but we'll also go back afterwards. And our current thinking is that anywhere where there is interest within a half mile of your property will connect you up with other people that use the tool. And so it's just an, one way that we can help generate these neighborhood management blocks for naval orange worm. And another key here is that Natural Resources Conservation Service actually has a cost share program where they will provide around $400 an acre, is the last number I heard, to implement a naval orange worm IPM program. And that in includes mating disruption and orchard sanitation. And one of the pieces that we're doing here is areas where there is a lot of interest in using Ag Neighbors is we will go out into those communities and hold meetings with groups of growers that have expressed interest as well as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we did this just recently 
in West Modesto. And I, don't, I think this is a very underappreciated program within NRCS. And I know a number of growers there expressed interest after they heard about what, uh, what they're offering, what NRCS is offering. And they're here today. How does it work once we get the results? If neighbors, uh, typically smaller, fives, tens, twenties, add up to 40 or more, we will make these connections. And like I said, we're even going broader because what I, the feedback I've gotten is that mating disruption isn't only effective at the edge of your field, uh, the pheromones actually spread much farther. So we think that uh, by using it in a region, not just on adjacent parcels, that's also going to help control navel orange worm. If you're a block that has interest, but your surrounding neighbors haven't filled out the tool, well then we're looking at how can we encourage further making those connections with the people around you because you do have the potential just because you're smaller than 40 acres, if you can work with your surrounding parcels of any of the, the, these three primary pest host crops, you can, you can create one of these neighborhood management zones. So we, we've got the tool going. Like I've, I've said several times, agneighbors.com, the passcode is NOWMD for Naval Orange Worm Mating Disruption. It's now available statewide. So anywhere, if you're a grower, uh, in California of almonds, pistachios, or walnuts. Just go on, fill it out, choose your parcel, whether or not you use mating disruption. And then when we close it, we're looking at an April closing date. We'll analyze the results and figure out where are there these concentrated areas of growers that are looking to create these neighborhood management zones. And then we'll follow up with uh, meetings between those growers and NRCS. But we'll also notify anybody that uses the tool of uh, the contact information for the growers that are in that half mile radius around you. I've talked about NRCS. There, there is a practice standard for naval orange worm. So it's, it's actually very well laid out and it's a good IPM program. So it's just a good piece of paper to, to get to know about how they work closely with UC to develop this IPM program for naval orange worm, work with NRCS and they will fund you to implement it. So I'm gonna leave this up just while Garrett, you're up next. And Garrett has been one of the growers that's used this and uh, has come to the grower meetings and uh, would really appreciate you sharing your experience and maybe a little bit about how you think this could help the industry. Thank you. So my name is Garrett Bowman. My family farms here on the west side of Modesto. Uh, in the middle of where this Ag Neighbors project is being piloted. So Jesse just asked me to just give my perspective on uh, how this might help our operation. I would say in our operation, we've been talking about naval orange worm mating disruption for the last several years. Uh, we talk about it and it seems like we end up kicking it down the road for, for another year. And there's a number of reasons for that. <clears throat> number one is that you know, a lot of our blocks are less than the 40 acre recommendation. And I've always just kind of felt like if we're gonna do it, let's do it well. You know, we don't spray half rates, we spray full rates. And so it's just kind of a, of a reason to <clears throat> not, not adopt it quite yet. Another reason is that our non perel rejects have historically been very low. Um, our non parels are typically well below 1%. And so trying to see the financial incentive, again, has just been kind of another reason to kick it on down. And then finally, it's just been the cost of, of the mating disruption. Um, if I'm not going to be able to reduce a spray initially, just kind of accepting that, swallowing that $100 an acre uh, initial investment with potentially maybe not a lot of return is just, especially in these economics as, as we, we've just <laughs> revisit again the next year. But all that being said, I think things are changing a little. Uh, as I look at our Naval Orange Worm Control Program, uh, while our rejects have maybe been stable, our farming practices have not been static. You know, 20 years ago, we were only shaking our non perels in the winter. Now we shake all the varieties. Uh, 20 years ago, our worm control was one application in May, time towards peach twig borer. Now we're making a, an application in May, time towards uh, naval orange worm. 
another one at whole split and possibly even a second one at whole split based on, on what trap counts are. So that's changing and I think uh, uh, mating disruption might be a way to maybe slow that down a little bit. <clears throat> and the neighborhood ag neighbors program can help us deal with the acreage uh, problem. We can work with our neighbors. And then we have also signed up for the, uh, uh, the cost sharing uh, within RCS. They've said that there is probably not going to happen in 23, but hopefully in 24 we'll be able to get some funds and then uh, implement the program and, and work together with the neighbors to have more of an area-wide uh, uh, adoption of it. So we're looking forward to it. I think it'll be a, a, a good way to move forward. Thank you, Garrett. If uh, you didn't get a chance to scan this or want more information, there's a table in the back where we took the responses from the growers in West Modesto and showed what some of these neighborhood management blocks might look like. So feel free to come back there and uh, check it out more. And then with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Miles Dakin with Pollinator Partnership to talk about another regional conservation partnership program that could also help fund some of these IPM type projects along with Habitat. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, so as Jesse mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about IPM and pollinators and then talk about our RCPP that we just got from NRCS. So I'm Miles, I am our director of Bee Friendly Farming for Pollinator Partnership. Um, I may have talked to many of you about this certification, um, but uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about how integrating pollinator habitat can support your IPM program and also implementing IPM supports pollinators. So a lot of our habitat that we recommend like hedgerows and even cover crops um, directly support beneficial insects, not just pollinators. So a lot of our natural enemies are supported by these, um, these habitat types and those do help directly with your IPM programs. Um, I always like this example on the left here, that's a surfed fly. The larva is a predator, the larva eat aphids, and the adult is a pollinator. So in this case, you're actually getting both a pollinator and a predator. Um, but there are numerous species that are supported by these hedgerows and by these other habitat types that are going to help keep your pest pressures low um, you know, across a lot of variety of pests. There's a lot of really good science that exists in California in the Central Valley to show that these hedgerows are benefiting your IPM programs and offering pest control. We normally see about a, a range of about 200 meters from your hedgerow into your field in terms of providing um, benefit. So as you think about implementing habitat, think about distributing that habitat, think about putting in multiple hedgerows, um, you do get about a 200 meter radius of, of benefits. And then obviously, how can IPM support pollinators? So pollinators are at Pretty bad times for pollinators right now. Um, and this is you know, all pollinators, not just honeybees. And so as you implement IPM programs, you, know, you are going to, one of the issues that they're facing is you know, pesticide exposure, poor nutrition, um, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so implementing IPM, you know, the goal of that with, when we're talking about pollinator health is to reduce potential exposure of pesticides to the pollinators. Um, using potentially lower toxicity ingredients. Um, and then, like I just talked about, encouraging the use of beneficials, you know, encouraging, you know, making that a priority, saying, okay, I can implement this habitat to not only support pollinators, but also these other beneficials that are gonna help me potentially reduce my input. Uh, and now I'll switch to our RCPP. So um, we were awarded $1.7 million from NRCS this year. Um, in partnership with the Almond Board, Blue Diamond, California Cattlemen's Wine Institute, Project APSM, a whole bunch of partners that were really excited to partner on this project. Um, it's very similar to the program that Jesse just talked about, except this is a regional farmer to farmer um, collaboration project that is al also includes habitat. So we're looking at habitat practices like hedgerows, cover crops, um, a whole bunch of other ones and IPM. So about $1.2 million of this grant is gonna go directly to farmers as incentive payments to do these practices. We are limited by 10 counties in California. Obviously not all of them have almonds, but the goal is to get 
neighboring farmers to apply for this funding together or simultaneously. And if they do that, then you have a higher chance of getting the funding based on the ranking system. So the more neighbors you have apply with you, the more likelihood you all get that funding. We are going to be working with the partners to specifically target regions that you know have a lot of overlap within the cropping systems that we've chosen, um, and then um, work with these farmers together to implement these practices. So if you're interested, we have we still have to sign the agreement with NRCS, but we have gotten the funds. Um, this first year is mostly about outreach and education, with implementation starting in 2024. So if you're interested, it's best to get let us know. You can email me. I'll be around now because the, the more time we have to plan, the better. It is a big project. But we are really excited to partner with the industry and really excited to get some habitat in the ground and IPM. So um, it's really, really exciting. If you're more interested in other financial assistance programs and technical assistance programs, we are having a webinar a week from today that you are more than welcome to attend. It's free. And I think that's it. Actually, I think we have time for a couple of questions, if there are. Yeah, Mel. Mel. Mel's making a great point, which is most of the people that have used it so far are the ones that are not currently using mating disruption. To really coordinate, uh, like we we're talking about, you can have different uh, levels of sanitation, some people using mating disruption, some people not. So whether or not you're using mating disruption Go on and fill out the tool because it's an opportunity to work together if you're already doing it and maybe your neighbor's not, maybe to figure out how can how can they get into this program. Right. But if if price is an object, then uh, helping them and or encouraging them to apply to the NRCS funding, that will that will greatly reduce the cost of doing any of these practices. All right, yeah, I just would uh add to emphasize to the PCAs in the audience that this tool is now available statewide irrespective of participation in this program. So this is an opportunity to work with your colleagues to really get at that problem of the edge effects that we hear so much about with naval orange worm. Um, and um, while the neighborhood program is not necessarily a fast portal to NRCS, there's a lot of participation of NRCS in the activities. So it is a great way to get access to those incentive dollars. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program that Miles just spoke about does have sort of an expedited window into NRCS and perhaps or is likely to not have the same adjusted gross index caps that prevent some of the larger growers from participating. So definitely talk to these folks during the break. There's coffee and I'm sure there's still donuts and there's some folks at tables you can also talk to uh, or grab one of the speakers. So enjoy, we'll be back at 9.40. <laughs>